your dad and I were deer hunting in Texas, all right? So we were driving. We would go to this place called Encino Ranch. And I remember. It, yeah, yeah. I remember the name of that. Yeah. yeah. He went there a lot. Yeah. A lot, right? So we would get on this high rack, and we would drive around looking for deer. So the majority of the time was spent having a beer and looking for deer, right? So <laughs> <laughs> T-shirt idea. Yeah. Yeah. So... <laughs> We were sitting there one day, and he was going through his negotiations on his contract, and it was having a, uh, you know, it was a rough negotiation. About what year is this? Man, Mike, I don't know. I can't okay. really remember. All right. Didn't matter. But it was before. Uh, well, I don't know. Okay. But he was he was going through a negotiation, right? And to the point where there was a, a rumor or two that he might move to Ford. What? Right. Yeah. So anyway, he was like, "I ain't moving to Ford," but somehow or another. When he went to the racetrack, you know, he'd get rental cars. The only car left was a Ford, and he showed up in a Ford, and that it started it all, right? I got you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so he wasn't going to do that. But anyway, we're sitting there talking, and he's telling me, you know, it's, you know he's going to get it done, but it's tough right now. And I said to him, I said, hey, I said, why don't you just go drive for yourself? He goes, no, no we're not ready to win. I said, what are you talking about? He goes, we're not ready to win. He goes, I'm not leaving. Let me tell you something. He goes, you never leave a winner to go to a loser. RCR is a winner. We're proving it. DEI is going to be a winner, but they're not a winner yet. So you never, ever leave a winner to go to a loser. Never. Well, I'm sitting there, and I told him, I said, hey, let me tell you something. <laughs> I'm going to have to leave a winner to go to a loser. And he goes, no, you're not. And I said, the only way I'm ever going to get a chance to manage in the big leagues is I'm going to have to go to a loser. And that's the only way I'm going to get my shot. And he goes, no, you're not. You're going to stay right there in Atlanta, and you're going to take over when Bobby retires. I said, Dale, Bobby's not retiring for 10 to 12 years. He said, I don't care. I said, listen, I'm going to have to go to a loser. He grabbed me and pulled me over to his face. And he said, Ned, you never ever leave a winner to go to a loser do you understand you never do it well i, I was done with this conversation okay yeah i get it right <laughs> i get it so in 2002 is when this happened right yeah so the first time i get this job i put on this uniform and all i can do is hear your dad in the back of my head mm. like what in the hell are you doing right what in the hell are you doing and it went on like that. I had a picture of your dad in my office, and it was one of those pictures that wherever you are in the room, he's looking at you, right? Yeah. It was one of those. We would come in after losing a tough game. I'd throw my lineup cards on the table, and I'd look up, and he'd be staring at me. And I'd, I mean, if this happened once, it happened 100 times. They're like, what the hell are you looking at? Because <laughs> you know? I could hear him. I could hear him, right? So it was it was. A little bit tough for me to do that. Yeah. But my goal was to go from a winner, go to a loser, and make it a winner. Yeah. And we finally, we were on the verge of doing that in Milwaukee. And, um, you know, it didn't work out, but we, we got there in Kansas City. So when we made that last out uh, in the World Series in 2015, all I can think about was your dad. Really? Well, yeah, that's it. It's a C. Dale. I left a winner, I went to a loser, and we made it a winner. And I just knew how proud uh, I knew how proud he was going to be in, you so know, that, at that time. So that speaks to the profound effect that he had on you. Um, and let's go. Let's let's learn how y'all met. So when do you do you remember the first time you and Dad crossed paths? Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, we I had lived in Mississippi. And Jody Davis and I came up together in the Mets organization, right? Jody was a year behind me. So Jody was from Georgia. I'm from Mississippi, or my wife's from Mississippi, right? And we loved to deer hunt. So we would talk about deer hunting all the time. And in 1975, I get traded to uh, the, the Milwaukee Brewers. Jody gets traded to the Cubs, so we kind of split that way, right? Well, Jody's career was much better than mine. Jody was a first-string catcher. I was a second-string catcher. But back in the mid-'80s, 
or to the 86 or 87 right at, in there somewhere, Jody signed as a free agent with the Atlanta Braves. And now I'm with the Braves, right? So we're kind of back together again. And we're talking about hunting, and Jody's coming to Mississippi to hunt. And um, I had this place. Uh, one of my best friends um, was a timber buyer. And the guy that owned his lumber mill was a guy by the name of Warren Hood, and he had a fantastic place to go hunting, right? I mean, just a phenomenal deer hunting place. I always wanted to go give it a shot. Found out the guy was a huge Dale Earnhardt fan, right? So I didn't really know your dad from Adam at that point. Mm -hmm. So went to spring training, and I'm talking to Jody, and I'm trying to get in. I want to hunt this place, right? Mm -hmm. So I said, uh, hey, uh, you know, you guys got to come. If you bring Dale, we'll be able to hunt this place. This place is a really <laughs> cool place, right? Yeah. So he's like, okay, all right. So he talks to Dale. Well, they set it up, right? Yeah. So the winter comes along, and Jody, we're getting close, and we're getting closer, and Jody calls me and he goes, hey, okay, we're, we're coming Tuesday. And I said, okay, cool. We've got everything set up. we got stand. This is going to be a blast, man. We're going to have fun. He goes, hey, uh, let me tell you, you know, this guy, he's a little different now. You know? What does he mean? He says, if he, don't, if he don't like where he's at, he'll get up in the middle of the night and go home. He'll leave, right? <laughs> so I'm like, Jody, the hell with it. No, forget it. No, I'm not playing this game. Uh -uh, I'm not doing that. Uh-uh. I'm not. And he goes, no, no, it'll be cool. It'll be good. It'll be good, right? <laughs> so I've got this mindset, okay, yeah. who the hell's coming in yeah. here, right? So sure enough, they fly to King, <laughs> they fly to King Air in, and we absolutely had a blast. I mean, we hunted for like four or five days. Dale went home, came back the next weekend, and we hunted again. And from that point on, we just hit it off, you know, and we just became good friends. And uh, it was it, it was all for the love of the outdoors, I think, together. And, yeah. you know, the cool thing about it was when you sit back and and think about it, and I think this was why Jody was, you know, was such a good friend too. The more you were around your dad, it just seemed like everybody wanted to compete with him, you know, because he was the intimidator, you know. They, they wanted to catch the biggest fish or shoot the biggest deer. And, you know, I, I made a point that I'm not competing with this guy. You know, we're going to be friends, but if he wants, if he kills the biggest deer, that's fine. He catches the biggest fish, that's fine. If we're standing in the urinal, he pees longer than me, that's fine. <laughs> I don't care, right? Yeah. We're not going to compete. And I'm not going, you know, to deluge him with racing questions. And he didn't deluge me with baseball questions. He was a Braves fan. Yeah. And it was just, uh, you know, it was just a great relationship, you know, between the, the, the two of us. And I think the education, watching him, Somebody told me one time, if you want to be successful in a field, find the person that's the most successful in that field and do everything exactly the way that he does. And that made sense to me at that time. Now, I knew that I wasn't a race car driver, right? But I knew that he was a champion, a champion's champion, and had to try to figure out what made him tick, right? So some of the questions I would ask him was like, who's your friends in racing? Hmm. And this was early, late 80s. And he goes, I ain't got no friends in racing. <laughs> said, you, what do you mean you ain't got no friends in racing? He goes, I ain't got no friends in racing. You, you got to have friends in racing. He goes, let me tell you something. I don't ever want anybody to look in their rear view mirror, see the black three behind them, and think for an absolute second that I'm their friend. And that was his mindset, you know, back in those days. It was that he was going to give no quarter he wasn't gonna let up to anybody he wasn't gonna give anybody a break and I started to understand his mentality on um you know what it took to be a champion now his idea of what it took to be a champion was a lot different than mine right at this point uh and I thought it was cool because in baseball it's tough and and in racing you you can probably understand too because I've, I've thought about this, the definition of what is a win, you know? And, and in baseball, you play 162 games, right? And you play every day. It's a, a failure-driven sport. If you're going to be a star, you're going to get three hits for 10 at-bats. It's the seven outs that drive people crazy. It's the ability to handle failure that drives people crazy and makes a difference between success and not success. So if you look at a contract and thinking through this in any sport, soccer, basketball, baseball, football, 
whatever it is, probably racing. The contract states your name, your address, all right? Then it's got some stuff you can't do in there, ride motorcycles or whatever, your sports. And then at the bottom, it says, we're going to pay you X amount of dollars, right? So I ask my players all the time, do you understand what the contract says? Well, yeah, I'm going to make this much money. I said, yes. But have you ever looked at it? Because the contract simply states that we're going to pay you X amount of dollars. Doesn't say anything in there about hitting 300. Doesn't say anything in there about hitting 40 home runs. It doesn't say anything in there about 120 RBIs. It doesn't say anything in there about 200 strikeouts. What the contract simply states is that we're going to pay you X amount of dollars for your very best effort every single day. So if you give your very best effort every day, that's all you can do. So you get these kids that that don't understand that the seven outs are a part of the game and they think that, you know, I'm such a failure. No, the way that you learn how to handle failure is to gauge yourself every single day. Are you giving your best effort? At the end of the day, and that was my one rule to my players, at the end of the day, when you walk into the bathroom, you look yourself in the mirror eye to eye, and you know if you've given your best effort every single day, that you were prepared, you were focused, you played hard for yourself, for your family, and your teammates. And if you can answer yes to all those, you've done your job, absolutely done your job, right? So go home, get a good night's sleep, come back and let's do it again tomorrow. But your dad was different. It was a different set of standards for your dad. Yeah. Because when uh, 94, we went on strike, and we'll talk about that a little later. My first race was Darlington, right? So he ended up finishing second behind Bill Elliott. For me, second is really, really good, right? Really good. We got in the truck because we were going back to his house. Man, second place was really good. He was pissed. I don't know. What are you joking? And he goes, no, second. What are you talking about? Second place is good. Second place is really, really good. And he goes, second place is the first one to lose. He said, there's nothing, there's nothing great about second place. And I thought it was a joke, but the more I was around him, it wasn't. He lived it. I mean, that was his mentality. And how he could handle that, um, the failure uh, of not winning all the time, but he was, he was a different person. You know, I've met a lot of, I've had the opportunity to meet five presidents and a bunch of different people. I've never met anybody like your dad. If you like that conversation with Ned Yost, you ought to listen to the entire interview because the Dale Jr. Download is available on all major podcast platforms.